Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now don't worry, this box doesn't contain man's worst enemy, the wireless printer. Instead, it contains man's second worst enemy, the pre-built Dell. I'm kidding, I have a long history with Dell machines and while they're not always perfect, it's the uniqueness that makes them great. If you're familiar with these systems, then you'll feel more than at home with the classics such as the laptop DVD drive in a desktop, the odd side panel design, the weird case design, the proprietary motherboard and power supply, the graphics card that looks like no other variant of the same model in existence, and of course the single stick, oh, two sticks of memory. Well, this is surprising. I picked up this Inspiron 3650 for £120 after submitting a cheeky offer and knocking 30 quid off the asking price, though it was listed as for parts or not working, but we'll get into that a little later on. After releasing this tiny tower from its packaging prison and taking a brief look inside, the first thing I decided to do before removing any hardware or blasting it with an air duster was to check for any loose cables. While so many of the couriers where I live are very good, and very careful sometimes a cable or two will get shaken loose. Furthermore the main issue with this machine according to the seller was that it didn't boot into windows so it makes sense to check for anything that's come unplugged anyway. Everything looks to be in order. Next up came the power on test. Now I'm not technically minded so a fix for me usually involves a heat gun, a hammer, or bad language, sometimes all three if I'm really determined. Luckily, just as described, the Inspiron turned on just fine, but it went straight into the BIOS. Here we can see the specs, of which I was already aware of, but it's nice to confirm everything and of course, let you guys know what we got. This is a Skylake based Inspiron which, according to the service tag, shipped in mid-2016. From what I could find it cost around $900 US back then, though it could have started life a little more expensive. I also saw a few sites reporting a huge discount on this machine, down to around $579. There was also a gamer edition, and from what I could find, the only difference was a red trim around the outside of the front panel. There was probably more to it than that though. It turned out that enabling secure boot from the BIOS was all I needed to do to actually get it to boot into Windows, though I'll probably reinstall Windows 10 anyway at some point because it is running an ancient version and creating a bootable USB would be quicker than sitting through the millions of updates. It could do with an SSD upgrade as well, but I'll leave that up to the new owner because a 2TB HDD is still a very nice inclusion in my opinion. Having been out in the world since 2016, it's no surprise that there is a bit of dust here and there, not to mention the thermal paste has dried up. I've seen sandpaper with more moisture than this. This will wipe off easily and I'd always suggest replacing the paste if you buy used pre-built. A good clean and dusting is always a nice idea too for the CPU fan, system fan and graphics card. My four-legged pet hair detector also informs me that the previous owner did not have an animal which, in my experience, means that the dust should be easier to shift and less compact. I gave everything a quick dust and a blast with the air duster and soon enough our old Dell Inspiron was looking as good as new. Well better, anyway. The R9 360 is basically an OEM version of the R7 360, a once solid lower cost card. It requires no power connector so it draws all its power from the PCIe slot. I'll make a separate video on it soon, the i7 6700 as well, but that hails from the 4 core 8 thread era of Intel chips, an era I thought was going to last much longer, but didn't thankfully. Now it's faster than a flagship 4770 but not as snappy as the later 7700 as you might expect. I'm not sure if the DDR3L memory is impacting the score at all and if so by how much but the 6700 seems to be behaving normally. It's hitting its stated all core 3.7 gigahertz turbo and not getting as warm as I thought it would inside this somewhat restricted case. I like the aesthetic of this Dell but I can't imagine it's ideal for heat dissipation. At least we got dual channel memory in here though, so performance is already better than it could have been. So I'm going to test a few games here, the first of which is Spider-Man Remastered. Now this card supports DX12, so every game should run, but of course we do have that 2GB GDDR5 limitation, and already we are pretty much 
hitting that. This is actually with the very low settings, so we can't really go any higher. The card doesn't have the power to allow for that anyway. Now we're using about 10 gigs of RAM. The CPU isn't really being utilized that heavily because the card is the main limitation and will be. Oh, okay. I guess the card has given up completely. <laughs> Look at the textures on the building. The, oh, it's loading. There's a loading icon. Is it gonna carry on? Is it? Yes, there we go. Not ideal when you're trying to play fast paced games, but there we go. In Forza Horizon 5, also at 720p here, we were able to hit at least 60 FPS, which was quite surprising. As you can see, the CPU is hitting its maximum turbo. The RAM usage is about 12 gigs, and the card is maxing out at 100% and hitting its VRAM limitation too, as well as its GPU clock maximum, which is 1.05 gigahertz or 1050 megahertz it's hitting around 71 degrees which isn't too hot and the system isn't too loud either the cpu is hitting roughly the same temperature and i can definitely feel some heat coming out of this case but yeah there's there's no major issues here nothing's switching off or giving us any artifacts so that's always a good sign Alright, so the next game's a bit older, Left 4 Dead 2. I just wanted to show you how well older games run. This is with max settings and 4 times MSAA enabled. The CPU isn't really doing much here. It's hovering around 20 to 30% utilization. The R9 360 between 90 and 100%. So again, it's the limiting factor, but it isn't boosting to its maximum clock here. So this game certainly isn't stressing the system too much. Interestingly though, it is still hitting 70, 71 degrees, but our frame rate overall was well over 100. All right, so we have GTA 5 now. This gameplay was absolutely disastrous. I was crashing into everything. I actually kept the resolution at 1080p, which was perhaps a little bit of a mistake. We didn't quite hit 60 FPS, but I did have to turn the texture resolution down to normal to even get this average. Everything else was on high and the advanced settings were all switched off. The i7 70, sorry, 6700 has a lot more to give, but the card isn't so great in 2023. 2022, really, it's only a week into January, so yeah. <laughs> Now if you want to, you can even play Cyberpunk, albeit with 720p resolution and FSR enabled and set to, I think it's quality, it might be ultra quality, but the exact settings will be up on screen. I was quite surprised with this result, over 30 FPS, over 40 in fact for the most part, and this is when driving through busy city areas. The CPU holds up fine, but of course it would when the R9 is the limiting factor. Now I don't think there's much difference between this OEM variant and the standard R7 360, if any. I think again that card is also similar to the R7 260, so yeah, it's, it's going to struggle these days, but... If you turn the settings down low enough, you might be in for a surprise. Crisis Remastered at 900p, the often forgotten about sweet spot resolution, over 60 FPS here, which was quite surprising, and even at low, the game looks good. Anti-aliasing is also turned off. In those areas where you're going to see a lot of explosions, you might see a few dips and drops, but nothing major. Finally, it's Fortnite, which was a bit of a stuttery mess, but it didn't stop me from wiping out a few enemy players like a true pro that I am. Now, the i7 is going to be the cause of some of that stutter, but again, the graphics card is the bigger problem. Low settings at 900p here, just to try and alleviate some of those issues. Overall, the Optiplex, sorry, force of habit, the Inspiron, is still doing okay, a GPU upgrade wouldn't go amiss, something like a 1050 Ti perhaps, something that doesn't require an additional power connector, but I am wondering if there is some sort of adapter we could get to perhaps add a 6 pin to this thing. Maybe that's something we'll have to investigate. Thank you very much for watching, if you enjoyed this one leave a like, leave a dislike if you didn't, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.